Hi, I'm Joan Goodchild for RSA. I'm joined today by Mike Newborn. He's the Chief Information Security Officer with Navy Federal Credit Union. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. We're going to start right off um, talking about a topic that we've been talking about for a while, but everyone's always interested, digital transformation. From your perspective, how is it changing the way businesses are managing security and risk? So I think it's doing a few things. Um, digital transformation, and I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Um, to me, it means uh, you're essentially expanding your, your digital footprint, right? You're trying to reach your, your customer base uh, in, in a, in a multi-mode way, uh, and in doing so, uh, you're going to employ new technologies. Uh, you may also use technology to your advantage internally. You may have a lot of analog historical processes that you did. You might try to put more automation in place. Um, and so a lot of organizations that I've seen are undergoing digital transformations, especially um, in the financial industry these days where, where I live. And so what do you think that's meant, you know, in, in your region, in your um, line of business? What's that meant for financial institutions or what is it meant for Navy Federal? So it means a few things, right? I mean, for financial institutions, uh, there's a lot of competition out there, right? There's a lot of these up and coming fintechs that are offering a lot of like really uh, great um, value, ser value added services to, to people out there. Um, and, uh, and it's very simple to turn them on, right? You give them your credentials, they have access to your systems, and you know, you're, you're getting instant value. And I think a, a lot of us in these financial institutions are really, you know, we're seeing this as uh, something that we, you know, we, need to, we need to be able to add value to our current members on. Um, and so I think it's, it, it provides a phenomenal opportunity uh, to drive competition, and um, I think it's also forcing the adoption of digital in organizations that have been around a long time uh, that, that just haven't necessarily grown up just in that digital age. Um, I think the implications of it, though, um, are, are somewhat challenging from a security perspective. First, if, if you're going to if you're going to increase your digital footprint to do this, right, you're going to have an increased attack surface, so your risk is going to go up. Um, the same way that you protected, you know, your organization and your members or your customers previously, that's going to have to evolve and transform. Um, and I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is getting organizations to know how to protect their organizations in this sort of new way of doing business. And so, I mean, that also changes things almost culturally, too, with the way that, you know, businesses are not only doing business for their customers, but the way that they're developing products internally, and that impacts security. How is it impacting operating models? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, that's a great question. There's a lot of operating model changes, I think, that need to happen. Um, there is a cultural shift that needs to occur um, because digital is faster. Um, there's adoption of, like, more, more public cloud infrastructures to reduce the, the bottlenecks in the processes that previously existed. For example, you know, it might have taken uh, you know, uh, one to three months to deploy a server when you have to actually buy the metal and procure it. And now, you know, in a matter of minutes, you can do the same thing. And developers and organizations have capitalized on this ability. So now you can develop a new application and multiple times a day push features out, whereas before it might take yeah, every six to eight weeks you're making changes. So in order to protect that and provide the same capable, same level of controls um, that were applied in the, in the previous model, you've got to really do what you're you know, sort of describing, shifting left, right? You've got to get involved in that process earlier. You've got to employ um, more automation. Uh, we probably heard buzzwords like secure DevOps and that type of thing. You know, that's a, that's a methodology, it's a way of working. And it, it, involves, um, it involves a cultural change to really like push the responsibility away from the security team and onto the development teams and other parts of the organization. And, and, and as a security practitioner, our job is to equip these parts of the organization with the right knowledge and technologies and processes so that they can do what they need to do at, that, at the right speed but the right guard, but they have guardrails in place, um, and so when we say shift left, a lot of it's applied, you know, at the in, in the in the context of development. Um, but I think you can do that with a lot of different parts of the organization. Um, I think one challenge that people don't bring up, though, is that you're still expected to support all the existing systems at the same time. So I can't just go concentrate on the the new sexy stuff, right? I have to make sure that we're supporting. 
um, all of the existing pieces, and in organ, in, in, especially in financial institutions, I've got you know mainframes, and I've got systems that were put in some some 20, 30 years ago in some cases, and those aren't just going to magically migrate over to the cloud. Um, so you're you're probably for a very long time going to be supporting both these things. Well, at the same time, we've got to be shifting the way we work, and that's the operating model piece, yeah. right? So people, process, and technology, um, we've got to change the mindset of people and get them to think uh, more agile, you know, look at, be more results-oriented, and really think about, like, what problem am I solving for? I'm doing this task, I'm following a process, but what's the result that I'm looking for? And, and so on the people side, I think it's getting them comfortable that you're going to work in a, in a new way, um, but then also make sure they can still support the old ways too, right? On the process side, it's, it's really embedding these controls and these checks into the processes that the rest of the organization's going through. Um, and, and then I think on the technology, I mean, there's, there are plenty of opportunities, um, you know, when you're going into cloud or when you're, when you're leveraging a new capability because you want to be more digital, that means you're going to be bringing more you know, uh, more third party partners in, you're going to be bringing new technologies in. So I think with that, right, you've got to have a good way to manage that risk and then qualify what that is. And I think all that together and changing the way you do it, that is really how you have to ship the operating model. Right. Now you mentioned cloud yeah. in there as, you know, uh, again, one of the places that these teams are collaborating on and working in. So, you know, shifting gears a little bit and talking about cloud and, you know, again, the risks. Uh, that it introduces when putting workloads into the cloud. Give me your perspective on you know, best practices for managing apps and services in the cloud, for starters. Okay, so um, I think before I give you the best practices, right, we have to probably like, level set on a few things. The cloud is, 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 is similar and different than what you do on-prem. Um, there is really a shift in operating model there, right? First of all, on-prem you control like, the physical everything. Right, the cloud, you, you control the physical nothing. Um, and uh, there's a notion of shared responsibility model, right? So depending on what type of cloud service you're using, um, then your responsibility changes. For example, um, you have the most responsibility if you're doing something like infrastructure as a service where I'm just leveraging like a virtual machine on a cloud. I have to manage the entire stack on top of the, on top of the operating system. Um, on, on the other end, you could be doing serverless computing where I'm going to just give it a code snippet and all the operating system and the underlying uh, infrastructure that's going to run that code is all managed by the cloud provider. So what you do to secure it depends on what you're doing in there. It's not a one size fits all. The other thing to understand is that it is a shared responsibility model. So that means that even though the cloud providers are highly incentivized to provide a secure infrastructure and framework, um, they still require you as a customer to understand that you have to do certain things. Um, for example, I think we read about this in the paper a lot um, with, uh, I'll pick on Amazon for a second, but a lot of organizations are exposing data storage, S3 buckets to the world. Um, and, and Amazon gives you all the tools you need to make sure that's locked down, but it's your decision whether you do that. But if you expose basically, a, a, if you put a hard drive on the internet and let anyone access it and someone takes something, you know, it's hard to blame Amazon for that. Um, and I think that it's understanding the implications of the configuration options and what is considered a good golden state and how do you maintain that and monitor that continuously. Because the cloud now offers hundreds if not thousands of services and it's hard for anyone to keep up. So I think one of the first things you have to do is secure the configuration of the cloud, right? That's the first thing. Um, the second thing you have to do is understand what is an MVP, minimum viable product set of services, like a security service catalog that you need to have before you're going to allow your organization to go into cloud, right? Um, and I think you want that MVP to be commensurate with the risk you're facing. So one way organizations do it is based on data type, right? If I'm going to put in publicly available data just to try things out, my MVP probably can be, can be lower in the set of controls, but if I'm going to put in you know, confidential or you know, PII data in there, then I probably have a whole new level of MVP. So you need to have the right services that's probably doing things like making sure that I'm, you know, if I'm running IaaS, patching my systems mm -hmm. and keeping up with that, making sure that I'm vulnerability scanning and doing that, making sure that I have a good detection and response capability in there. Which by the way, doing detection and response in the cloud 
is different than doing it on-prem. So if you have a SOC or an MSSP that you're already using or you have in-house, you've got to make sure they're trained up on this. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. And these people are getting harder and harder to find. So you've got to figure out what that sort of MVP set of controls or capabilities are. And then the third thing um, is really around, I think, application security, right? You need to make sure that you have that sec DevOps mindset where you can, at speed, with really, really good coverage, make sure that you are incorporating those security testing capabilities into the code pipelines that kind of come along with cloud. Um, and I think, you know, you could, we could spend a lot of time talking about any one of these, but I think if you can get the trifecta down pretty well, you're ahead of the game. Now I want to just explore the responsibility aspect of it just for another minute with you when it comes to cloud. I mean, you mentioned the configuration responsibility, of course, the onus is on the organization to make sure you're configuring it appropriately in the first place. Is there ever any time when you know, there's some question about who's responsible for information in the cloud if it is breached or exposed in any way? I mean, I think, I, yeah, I think that, that happens all the time, right? Um, and I think we there have been some big breaches recently um, by well-known companies uh, where they've been questionable, right? We had data breach, was it you know, the cloud provider's fault? Was it, you know, was it the, the corporation's fault? Was it both their faults? Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, if the data comes from a company, at the end of the day, that company's on the hook regardless whether it's cloud or a third party, right? The company made the decision to put it wherever it is, and they're the ones that are ultimately responsible for that. Um, I think that, to, to be fair, um, if you've configured the cloud in a secure manner and there was a bug or an unexpected behavior, then in that place, you know, in that scenario, it's, it's the cloud provider that, that probably bears a lot of culpability. I don't hear about that much, right? I'm sure it's happened, I, I don't hear about that much. Generally, it's ignorance, it's pure ignorance. People go into this thing and it's so easy to spin up servers and it's so easy to do things, it's just, it's frictionless. Yes. Um, and I'd prefer to do that if I'm a, I'm a business owner or I'm a developer than have to go through the, the painful red tape of most organizations because I get immediate gratification. And it also kind of um, spurs innovation. But the you know, flip side of it is without the right governance models, you're taking on an increased risk. And I think the problem is we're not doing a good job articulating what that risk is to the right decision makers and companies. Because we don't understand it fully, we don't have good language and nomenclature for this across the industry. Um, and um, you know, I think it's just not well understood. So the share responsibility model also shifts, as I talked about before. If it's infrastructure as a service, you're on the hook for more. If it's platform as a service, you're on the hook for less. And a lot of times you bring new people in the company to run these cloud environments because the existing ones don't know how to do it or it's just not, they just, they don't know yet, right? The language of cloud is software development, it's code. So you take a traditional IT guy that's been racking and stacking gear in a data center or knows how to walk into, go into a Windows console and move some you know, uh, images around, right, and click buttons, and that's a little bit different than going in and like writing infrastructure as code. And so you also have a shift of responsibility, the people model in a company. The people running the cloud tend to be developers or more development background. They don't have the same operational discipline as a traditional IT person that goes through a change management board and you know, has like the, 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 the history of understanding what to do. So um, it's, it's, it's a good push and pull but at the end of the day, it does increase our risk, and I think that's what led us into a lot of the situations that we're in now. Right. Now let's talk about third-party risk and how companies are managing it. Um, you know, obviously the dependency on third parties is integral now in most business models. Um, in your opinion, what do companies need to be doing better in order to be managing third-party risks? So, I mean, first of all, this is a, I mean, it's a big topic, right? Um, I think we all think we're trying to manage third-party risk. Um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very tough battle because like increasingly companies, especially with digital transformations, are leveraging more and more third parties, whether it's services, whether it's software, um, whether it's software as a service. Um, so I think uh, one of the biggest challenges, first of all, even knowing which ones you're using, right? So you have to have a set of, an understanding of all the pieces that you're using. And in the larger your company is, and the less structured that procurement process is, um, the, the, the more difficult it is to get on top of it. But I think what you have to ultimately do is you have to take a risk-based approach. You have to tier your providers based on risk, right? So not all third parties um, are going to have the same risk. If something happens to the data or the thing that the third party's doing for you, the impact is going to be different depending on 
you know, what's happening. So let's say you have tier one through five providers, tier one being the most riskier, most impactful, and tier five being the least. You're going to want to spend the most time on tier one. You want to apply, you know, sort of differentiated protection concepts, right? Because we don't have enough resources in the cyber industry to protect all these the same. And, and frankly, it's not a good value. It's not good. It's not a good use of our resources. So you identify the tier ones and the tier twos and the tier threes. You focus on those. Um, what does it mean focus, right? You're going to ask more rigorous questions of them. You may be more likely to ask for independent pen testing. You may want to go on site. Um, so I think it's structuring that. But I think the hard part here is that these are happening so quick and there's a lot of effort, right, that goes on to managing third party risk. So I think this is like a very, very difficult game to do well um, and scale. Um, for example, most companies, you might ask your third party to answer 400 questions on a piece of paper. And you know, if you have customers, they're asking you to do the same, right? So this is like not a really good situation to be in and it certainly isn't tenable in the long run. But even if you can get past all that, just because they answer the question doesn't mean they're not going to have a problem, right? So you've got all up and coming technologies or companies that try to do outside in views on, has it, let me give your company a FICO credit score for cyber risk. And let me base it on whether I know they've had breaches and whether my dark web intel says they have data that's been exfiltrated and all that. Um, I think all of these pieces are, are key ingredients um, in, in doing it. And so I think that we're doing the best we can but it's, a, it's, it's not an exact science. And then you've got like contractual language and because you're applying multiple controls, right? Security says, I think that this is, I don't know, a moderate risk or it's a high risk, but if you do these things, your residual risk goes down to moderate. Um, I think that, you know, that's somewhat effective. And then you can put some legal language in there that if something happens, you owe us money or your insurance kicks in. I think that part's interesting too. Um, I think the more complicated thing um, is, is something where you start to get to like nth degree right. risk right here, where you have a third party that relies on another third party that's the same third party that another third party you have relies on it. For example, like simply, if two third parties rely on AWS and they're all deployed on the east coast of AWS and they, they support two different functions that are critical for the company and AWS goes down for some reason and they don't have a good you know, business resilience model, then you're down. Um, and so I think then it gets even more complicated. So I haven't seen anyone doing this like super, super well. I think we're, we're evolving and we're trying to work together. Um, but I think this is still a bit of a nascent area um, and, and a big challenge for us. I mean, it's, it almost sounds like you're saying yes as it evolves, but y you're, you're not sure if there's any one way or any control that you can put in to kind of mitigate that risk that um, really offers too much assurance. I am 100% sure about one thing, that there is no silver bullet to do this thing. It is a combination of um, process that you can try to automate, engagement with your company, incentives to make sure that they are going through the right processes so you have an opportunity to opine on the risk. Um, and then working with the business to try to come up with a way, if they want to use that third party, to make sure that risk is within your acceptable risk appetite. Um, or you can get them, you know, help them figure out another alternative. But when we talk about things like risk appetite, there is just not a, a good way. You've got model, like FAIR models and other models out there to measure and quantify what risk is. But these are still somewhat subjective. Um, and so that's why I think this is absolutely not an exact science. Well, Mike Newborn, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you for watching. For RSA, I'm Joan Goodchild.